All right, good to see everybody tonight. Uh, <clears throat> appreciate uh, Ned's class last quarter, did a good job, and I know those who were in here uh, enjoyed that study. You know, through the ages, nothing has intrigued man more than the subject of death and dying. And I say intrigued, not necessarily in a good sense of something that people like, but it's always been something that will get attention and something that uh, attracts our attention, I guess. And if you think about it, death is one of the oldest things known to man, is it not? You know, the first death was when and of what individual? Cain killed his brother Abel in the garden long ago. And I've often wondered, you know, Adam and Eve had never, they'd never seen death. They'd never experienced death, at least nothing that we know of. And, and, and we don't know the circumstances, but you've got to wonder, you know, did they find him? Did Adam go out looking for his son? Or did someone else go out and they find him laying his lifeless body in the field or on the side of the road or wherever? And, and they don't know, why is he laying? Is he asleep? What's wrong with him? Perhaps his body was cold and still, I don't know. These are just all thoughts. But how did they deal with it? Did they realize what had happened? Did they really have a concept of what death is all about? And men have been dying, or people have been dying ever since. And yet at the same time, we're really no, no more accustomed to it now than we were then. You know, I've done over 150 funerals over the years. And ironically, I counted, I've done almost the same number of weddings. And somebody asked me, what's the difference? And I said, just the music they play. But anyway, that's another story. But out of that 150, you'd think, oh, well, you'd be used to it. But you know, it's still, when I walk up and I look at that corpse in the casket, it does something. I don't know if you ever get used to it, being around death and dying. And we all have questions. And, and frankly, death is not something people like to talk about, is it? I mean, how many of you go gone to a family reunion and somebody says, Hey, what do you think about dying? Hey, how do you want to die? Now, maybe your family is different than mine, but we don't have those discussions. Now, perhaps you may talk about funeral arrangements, where you want to be buried, or who you want to do your memorial service and things. But, you know, as a rule, most people want to avoid death and dying, don't they? When's the last time you saw a funeral home advertising in Time Magazine or People? Cremation, buy one, get one free. You don't see that. You know, layaway plan on caskets. I mean, they, they just don't do that because people don't want it. In fact, most people, if you hand them something on death, death and dying, go to the state fair. I mean, they're... There are people giving out literature on everything, drug rehabilitation, alcohol rehabilitation. If you've got fallen arches, they got something for, they got something for everybody. But I've never seen anybody from the funeral home there because it's just not the kind of thing that people usually want to deal with until they're forced to deal with it. And usually that happens when somebody dies. Now, in recent years, you've seen a little upsurge in, in pre-planning and things like that. But I've heard people say, no way. I'm not going up there and talking to the funeral home before I'm dead. Why? Because we have an aversion to it, don't we? And, and, and maybe people in the world more so than in the church. But, but in recent years, it's interesting, there's been somewhat of a resurgence in the study of thanatology. Who knows what thanatology means or is? Thanatology comes from the Greek word thanatos. And if you look up thanatos, it simply means death or separation. And so thanatology is the study of death. It's the study of dying. And the interest in the subject of death, as I say, is spreading and growing. A lot of your major universities are actually offering courses in thanatology. I never heard of that 40 years ago. When I was in college, uh, if they had anything like that, we didn't know about it. But they're offering classes, they're offering seminars, they're offering short courses. And, and, and you know, in recent years, there have been several court cases dealing with the individual's right to die or not to die. 
And so there has been, as I say, an upsurge in the interest, but as a rule, people don't like to talk about it. In fact, the average person, and, and correct me, maybe some of you are different, but the average person views death with utter fear and horror. And there are any number of reasons, I think, why they do. I think a lot of people simply do not understand. There's a mystery surrounding it. There's the confusion. There's the question, what's on the other side? And in all honesty, I've had, I've had a lot of Christians tell me, and usually it's older Christians who are, no, they don't have long to live, say, you know, I'm scared about dying. And it wasn't that they weren't faithful Christians. It wasn't that they weren't prepared. So what would you attribute that fear of death and dying to? The unknown? I mean, let's face it, we all fear what we don't know, don't we? You know, if you know you have to go into a dark room, there's no light, you don't have a candle, you don't have a flashlight, you know you've got to go into a pitch black room and you have no idea what's in there. Are you just going to go traipsing in there boldly or are you going to go in there? Honey, come with me. <laughs> the unknown. Maybe we know there's nothing in there, or at least we think there's nothing in there, but, but basically we have a fear of things we don't know or that we don't understand. And of course it was into this world of fear and confusion that Jesus came in John 10 and verse 10, and he said, I come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Of course, in the Old Testament, there are a lot of hope in regard to death and dying. I mean, somebody give me a passage of comfort in the Old Testament about death. And there are some that would possibly be what? Yeah, but, but I said passages of hope. Uh, there are not a lot of passages, and then there are a few, but you know, you come to the New Testament, we have all kinds of passages. Offering hope, don't we? I mean, one, one of my favorite, Paul's words shortly before he was put to death by the Romans. The time of my departure is at hand. Was he frightened? No. What did he say? I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. And then to add further hope to what he's looking forward to, he said, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Was Paul scared of dying? I've often thought, I hope that I can have Paul's confidence, his openness when it comes time to die. Of course, we, we may not know that we die. We could die in a car crash, die in our sleep. But you know, here was a man that knew that he didn't have long to live. And he wasn't going to die what we would say a gentle death. You know, take this pill and you don't wake up. If history is to be believed, he was beheaded. That within itself would be terrifying. But yet he approached his death with, with all kinds of confidence. Another example, what about Peter? Remember, James has already been beheaded in the book of Acts by Herod. He arrests Peter. He's waiting until after Pentecost. He's going to have Peter beheaded. And the night before Peter was going to be beheaded, what's Peter doing? He wasn't praying, what? Sleep. Now, I'm sure he had said his prayers, but yeah, he sleep. How many of us could sleep if we knew that first thing in the morning a guy with a big axe is going to come in and they're going to stretch my neck out on a block of wood? And... Would you be sleeping? I'd probably be praying. <laughs> you know, but he had confidence. And, and there are many other examples of people. Um, and you know, going back to this promise of Jesus of abundant life in John 5, 24, Jesus talks about the, the assurance that we have after death of, of this abundant life. Notice, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this. Now here's the promise. Here's the, uh, the hope that's given to the child of God. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. 
they that have done good into the resurrection of life and they that have done evil into the resurrection of damnation. So there's the hope that the Christian has. If we have lived the Christian life, we're going to be raised. Does that sound like something we should fear? Does it sound like something we should avoid, you know, try to avoid? And yet in spite of this promise and many others, the masses continue to grope in darkness. They don't understand. You know, they're, they're terrified of dying. Most people don't want to talk about it. Here's some statistics I ran across. Every second of every day, somebody dies. Around the world, every second, someone's dying. Chances are we don't know them. But eventually, one of them is going to be my friend, my neighbor, my co-worker, my loved one, family member. The fact is, death affects us all. In America, every day, 5,000 people die just in the United States. Kind of reminds me of Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 5. Solomon says, for the living know that they shall die. Don't want to admit it, they don't like it, but we know it. Why don't we talk more about this appointment of death? You know, Hebrews 9.27 says it's an appointment, you know, it's something we can't get out of. Why don't people want to talk about it? It scares them, but, but, but what else? Uh, that's probably a lot of it. People think of what they should have done, could have done, but haven't done. You know, a Christian mother stands crying, asking, why did my baby have to die? And you talk about a hard job as a preacher, an elder, or for anybody to comfort that grieving mother or father. A wife sits in a daze after the unexpected husband's death and she mumbles, why did God take my husband? That one sometimes is even harder. A housewife answers the door and, and she sees two women standing there with Bibles in their hands, holding literature, and, and they ask if she'd like to study the Bible, so she invites them in. And after an hour or so, they leave the lady's house with an invitation to come back each week and study the Bible. And several, months later, uh, several months later, this lady goes to her preacher and announces that, that she's going to start going to this church down the road because they teach the truth on death and dying. And I think you know what I'm talking about. Groups such as Jehovah's Witnesses that teach annihilation, soul sleeping. You know, the, these doctrines may be comforting, but they can't be substantiated from the scriptures. But, but it raises the question, if you talk to these people, what does the Bible say? What really happens at death? I mean, obviously we quit breathing. We quit responding. The bodily functions cease. But do we really know what happens? Most people don't. You know, it amazes me that an otherwise rational human being, and an otherwise intelligent person, will give $500 to $1,000 to a so-called medium who promises, yes, we can contact your grandma, your grandpa. You can talk to them from the other side of the grave. Why would someone do that? No, no, why would somebody be willing to pay money to talk to somebody who's died? Because it gives them hope. It gives them something to, to cling to. Um, and again, because they don't know. They're looking for something, even though it costs a lot of money. Here's a scenario. A Christian young lady just lost her father. At the beginning, their church family, the church members were very considerate during the early days of a bereavement. But in the coming days, she begins to sink into depression. She begins to have some questions. And people begin to say things like, well, if she had more faith, she wouldn't be this way. If she had more faith, she could snap out of this. People begin to distance themselves. Someone says, poor thing. 
or bless her heart. There's nothing more we can do. And so they abandon her, for lack of a better term, and she sinks further and further into her depression. You know, people feel sorry for her, but what can they do? They don't know what to do. They don't know what to say. And that raises a question. How do we minister to those who are grieving? How do we comfort those who are hurting? And we're going to talk about this in a future lesson uh, this quarter. And at the risk of sounding simplistic, let me say I honestly believe that, that all of these problems could be dealt with much more efficiently if we had a better understanding of death and dying and, and, and what takes place. I'm talking about a biblical understanding of death and dying. And yet most people would just as soon avoid the subject entirely. In fact, one preacher was doing a class on this and he announced it from the pulpit that on beginning a certain Sunday or a Wednesday night they were going to do a class on death and dying and, and one of the men came up to him and said, are you kidding? A class on dying? Well, it's a biblical subject. And certainly it's a subject that affects each and every one of us. And I think deep down it's a subject we should want to know more about. I've never in my memory sat in on a class dealing with this subject. And if you start looking as far as books by our brethren, there are not a lot of books written specifically about the subject of, of death and dying. You'll find chapters and things in some books. But I want to give you some reasons this evening, this kind of introductory lesson to this, this quarter's class on death and dying. And if you don't come back, I'll understand. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Uh, just, just pass on down the hall. But uh, I want to give you some reasons why I think we need to be studying uh, the subject of, of death. First of all, because death is very real. Um, the Bible bears this out. You know, it's not something that's a figment of our imagination. It's not something that you, you know, see in the movies or you read about in the book, but, well, it's not real. You know, it's kind of like Santa Claus or, or the Easter Bunny, you know, mythical characters. Uh, you don't have to look far to find rem reminders of death. You open the newspaper, especially your large city, and there's row after row of obituaries. And oftentimes you may know, depending how long you've lived in the city, you may know one or more of those individuals listed there. You, know, you pass by a funeral home and you see cars lined up in the parking lot. You drive by the cemetery and you see those tents erected out there in the yard and you know someone has died. Um, the ringing of the phone in the middle of the night. What do you think when the phone rings at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning? Yeah, first thing. Of course, as a preacher, it's even more because, you know, we get called for any number of things like that. But you wonder, that's the first thing that pops into mind. Who died? Or who's been rushed to the hospital? Yeah, who's been in a car accident? You know, and, and, and how many times have we stood at the cemetery and looked into that open grave? Or we've watched as that open grave was filled in. So, so death is real. That's, that's one reason we need to deal with it. Uh, because it's a, it's a reality that's all too real. We can push it out of our minds. We can avoid it. And I know people, I've had people tell me, I don't go to funerals. And they were adamant about it. I said, are you going to go to your own? And I think the comment was, not if I can help it. But some people want nothing to do with it. But let's face it, every time we look in the mirror, we know we're another day, another week, closer to eternity, don't we? You know, George and Paul were sitting there together and we were laughing about bald heads and gray heads and I said, well, you know, that's the way with hair. Some turns white and some turns loose. Most of the time, it's a sign of age, isn't it? You look in the mirror, we see the wrinkles. We realize you can't run as far as we used to run. They can't run at all. You know, we realize if we're honest with ourselves, we are... Every day getting closer and closer to eternity. Not to sound morbid, but to sound realistic. But yet we live in a youth-oriented society. You know, you look at the commercials, you look at the ads. You know, if you'll just eat this, if you'll just drink this, if you'll go to this gym, you'll be young. You can do everything you did 50 years ago. Yeah, right. I'd be happy to do what I could do five years ago. But it's because we're getting older. It's a fact of life. We are born to die. The minute we draw that first breath, we begin to age. 
the countdown starts. But you know, another reason we need to study it because it's an appointment that we all have. Um, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. The only thing that's uncertain about that appointment is when it's going to occur, where it's going to occur, and how. I don't know where I'll die. Didn't really matter. Don't know when I will die. Doesn't really matter. Um, these are things that we have no control over. But I do know that I will die. Uh, going back to Cain and Abel, ever since Cain killed his brother, death has been striking down victim after victim. No exception except two men. Who were the only two men who have never experienced physical death? You know, Genesis 5 and verse 24. We talked about that, I think, two or three weeks ago in uh, Sunday morning sermon. And the second was the prophet Elijah, 2 Kings chapter 2. Only two men who've never, well, obviously those still living haven't died, but the only ones that have ever left this world without dying are these two. And because death is real, we, we can't ignore it. We can't turn our back on it. Uh, we need to face the reality of it and to understand it so that we can prepare for it. What, George? Well, yeah, there's a transition. I'm sure they changed. God changed them some way. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, but not a physical. They didn't just, they were taken up. Trans just like Jesus. Jesus ascended into heaven. It was a physical body, but at some point. Right. But, but when he went back, he changed. Exactly. When he went back to heaven there in Acts 1, he was changed. But, you know, a second reason. We need to study the subject of death because it's, has been avoided in far too many cases. Um, as I said a moment ago, you know, some people will not go to funerals. Uh, they're frightened of them. Uh, there are people that don't want to go in a funeral home. I know people that are terrified of cemeteries. You know, when I was a kid, maybe I was warped, but we used to love to go to these old cemeteries. We would go to Cahaba, Alabama, which was the first capital. And there was a cemetery there that most of the graves dated back to the early and middle 1800s. And I used to love to walk through that thing and look at these old stones. Some were so worn, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't read it all. Maybe just make out a date on them. And there was one I remember, it had an oak tree that at that time was probably two and a half feet across that had grown right up through the grave itself. And the headstone was behind the tree. That's how long it had been there. But I grew up with the reality that, you know, death is something that, that occurs. Um, and we have to be prepared to deal with it rather than simply to avoid it. But we need to study the subject to eliminate fear and superstition. How many people do you know have obeyed the gospel because they were frightened? I've had people say, well, I want to be baptized because I don't want to go to hell. And within itself, that, that's a valid reason, but should that be the primary reason? No. That should not be our primary reason. We should want to obey the gospel because we love God. Uh, we should obey the gospel because we want to go to heaven, uh, not simply out of some morbid fear or, or paranoia. Um, and if we fail to understand what God has revealed to us in the subject, we're going to be superstitious. And there's a lot of superstition about death. It's amazing the things you can hear from people. Things that have maybe been handed down, folklore or whatever, some of the silly things about death and dying. Um, and they're not based on God's Word. Um, of course, you know, in recent years, the rise of uh, spiritualism has uh, taught a lot of false ideas, things contrary to what the scriptures teach. Uh, you know, for example, we can talk to the spirit world, people can come back, and all of these things, communication with the dead, these spiritualistic teachings. Um, I find it interesting that under the law of Moses, those who practice spiritualism were to be put to death. It was a capital crime. Uh, and closely related to that is the subject of reincarnation. And, and if you're not familiar with the reincarnation, basically it says that we've all lived on earth before. In other words, we were here in a different life, different body, different person. A few years ago when I was in India, I had a chance to sit down and spend the morning with a Hindu, call him priest, they call him a... Basically, he was a Hindu priest. 
And we were talking about reincarnation because I, I didn't understand it, still don't understand a lot of their teachings. And uh, he was giving me stuff out of their holy book, the Ganesh. And uh, I said, wait a minute. So when you die, you're going to come back to earth just as a different person with a different body. He said, yeah, that's, that's what we teach. And we're sitting in a filthy, poverty-stricken village with open sewage in the streets, children malnourished, I mean, just really bad. And I said, so let me get this straight. When you die, you're going to come back, I said, in a better place. He said, yeah, in a better position was his word. I said, will you come back to Shalong? And he said, yes. I said, that's not a move up. I mean, to be translated out of one place of filth into a different body, but you're in the same place of filth. That's not an improvement. I don't even know if that would be called a horizontal move, much less a move up. And we discussed it at length, and I never could make him see that. You know, he said, now, if I live a bad life, I'll come back as a, as a beetle or a cow or some animal. And if I live a good life, I will no longer be a low-caste Hindu. I'll move up the caste level. But he's still going to be in the same filthy place. Um, and a lot of people, uh, oh, the movie star, I forget her name now, the actress... Uh, is big in reincarnation. Shirley yep, Shirley MacLaine. You know, she's uh, she's actually written a book. Well, I don't know if she wrote it, but what well, they call that a ghost writer, and uh, she's really promoted uh, reincarnation uh, in recent years. And, and some of the other Eastern religions and cults uh, emphasize this idea of reincarnation. Uh, and you know, this thing about death. Most places people go when they get back, you can pump them for information. Hey. You went to the White House. Tell us what it was like, especially in that pool of water. <laughs> Get George to tell you about the pool of water. Uh, you can ask people, but you can't ask somebody what happens when you die. What's it like? You know, as somebody said, do what? I have no idea. <laughs> My beetle, he says. Uh, but nobody's ever lived to tell about it, have they? So what's the only reliable source of information we have on the subject of death and dying? The Bible. I mean, you know, your friends can say, oh, here's so and so happens when you die. Or my grandmother says, how do they know? Unless it's from the Bible. And so it's really a waste of time to sit around and talk about, well, I hear this happens, I hear that happens, and this, that, and the other. We need to actually look at God's Word and, and just see what, uh, what it has to say so that we can know, you know, correctly. Uh, right? Yeah. Even those who were brought back, as far as we know, at least nothing was recorded. You know, Lazarus came back, and don't you know, people were saying, Lazarus, what was it like? What did you see over there? And you know, one of the things that's amazed me, and I've been doing some reading here recently uh, in regard to these uh, uh, ADEs, after-death experiences, and two things have struck me, and I don't know if anybody ever has noticed, everybody always says, oh, it was warm, it was beautiful, and it was a bright light. Nobody ever says, it was hot. There was fire everywhere. I mean, it doesn't matter who they were, what kind of life they've lived, it was always beautiful, glowing light. I saw lights when I had surgery. There were those bright surgery lights over. <laughs> that was the only light I saw. But uh, again, we had this misconception, you know, the, oh, well, I, and I've even had members of the church say, oh, I died and came back. No, you didn't. The Bible says you die once. And after this comes the judgment. That doesn't mean your heart hadn't stopped beating, things like that. But death is the separation of the body and the spirit. And we're going to talk about that more later. When the spirit leaves the body, forget it. It's over. There is no coming back. Um, you know, there's a lot of, as I say, a lot of false teaching in regard to uh, 
death and dying. Doctrines such as purgatory and limbo, these are doctrines that are taught by the Roman Catholic Church. And, and these two doctrines have fostered all kinds of bizarre beliefs uh, in regard to the subject. Um, of course, limbo uh, is where babies go who die. Uh, and of course, they have no chance to, uh, to be saved. And of course, purgatory is where you go and you have a chance to uh, basically work your salvation out. You go to purgatory for a period of years, however long it may be, but then eventually you can come out of purgatory and you can uh, spend eternity in heaven. And there's nothing in the scriptures, you know, the rich man and Lazarus make that very clear that once we die, our fate is sealed. Crossing over from one side to the other, uh, there is no coming back to help people. You know, the rich man wanted uh, Lazarus to come back and warn his brothers and couldn't do it. Abraham said, they got Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. He said, oh, but they'll listen if somebody came from the dead, but it didn't happen. It can't happen. Um, and, of course, two other false doctrines that you hear a lot about are soul sleeping and annihilation. You know, soul sleeping is the idea that at death your soul just sleeps unconsciously in the grave. And the body, uh, excuse me, the soul will be resurrected from the earthly grave uh, at the end of time. Annihilation is the idea that the wicked are simply going to be destroyed at death. There is no punishment. There is no torment. And all of those passages that talk about eternal punishment, eternal fire, pain, anguish, all of those things, uh, they're not true. They're just metaphorical, we're told. Um, but another important subject, a reason for studying the subject, and to me this is one of the most important because we need to be able to help the bereaved. The hardest thing in the world, I think, is comfort someone who has lost a very dear loved one, whether it's a spouse, a child, a sibling, a parent, whatever. I mean, what do you say? How many of you have a hard time comforting people? I mean, does anybody really find it easy? Even as a preacher, all of the, the death that I have dealt with, all of the funerals, when you walk into that hospital room and the family's there by the bedside, they're, they're in anguish, they're heartbroken. What do you say? You know, I say, I'm sorry, and you think, wow, that's really lame. That just doesn't, doesn't get it. You know, we can say, well, I know what you're feeling, and that, that doesn't do it. Yeah, but, but even that, is it, does that really comfort them? Uh, and I decided a long time ago, there's nothing that I can say that will really offer comfort or anybody else. Now, they can appreciate the fact we're there for them, but, you know, nothing is going to take away that pain. Nothing is going to heal the heartache and the sorrow, is it? And those of you who have, who have lost close loved ones, you know what I'm saying? doesn't matter what somebody says. You know, all the donuts and coffee and the cards and the flowers and the visits, all the kindnesses that, that our church family may do for us, it doesn't really comfort in the absolute sense, does it? And we don't have time to get into it tonight, but you know, when we're talking about comforting people, are we talking about comforting Christians or are we talking about comforting non-Christians? Now, I personally find it very easy to comfort Christian families who's lost a Christian loved one. You've heard me say it before, the easiest funeral in the world is the funeral for a faithful child of God. The hardest funeral in the world for me is for somebody who did not obey the gospel, who died without Christ. And the difference is night and day. But, you know, we need to be able to... Uh, to deal with them. Uh, Dr. Thomas Holmes, who is a psychiatrist at the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle, listed 43 life events, and, and I, I was reading this, and I thought, you know, this guy really needs to get a hobby. I mean, some of these studies are amazing, but he listed a hundred things um, from Z on a scale, or excuse me, 43 events on a scale of zero to a hundred that impact our lives. Guess what he said the number one thing that impacts our life? The death of a spouse. The death of a close family member rated fifth. The death of a friend rated 37th. And I thought, we need a psychiatrist to tell us that? 
I mean, obviously, we're all affected by death. It doesn't matter if it's a, a very, very close family member or if it's a third cousin we haven't seen in years. Now, we may grieve more for some than others, but let's face it, we're all affected by the loss of family. What do you think about when you go to the funeral home, when you go to the cemetery, or when you come to the building for memorial service, what's one of the things that runs in your mind? How much time do I have left? You ever think, wow, that could be me. Those could be my flowers. You know, we all have different thoughts, you know, but, but we're all affected by death to some degree or another. Even though it may not be my loved one, you know, family, an acquaintance, a co-worker, a neighbor, but we're, we're all affected by that. Yep, weddings and funerals, I've heard that said many times. <laughs> yep. And again, as Christians, we ought to be able to, you know, Paul said, weep with those that weep. Rejoice with those that rejoice, weep with those that weep. But how do we do that? And that's one of the things we're going to talk about in one of the lessons, some ways to, to try to comfort those who are bereaved. And again, every situation is different. You know, are we talking about the death of a child? Are we talking about the death of someone who, you know, was advanced in years? Are we talking about someone very suddenly, very healthy, just drops dead? Are we talking about somebody who's been terminally ill for months? So every situation is going to be different. But, you know, as children of God, we ought to be able to try at least to uh, offer comfort and solace to, uh, to these people. And if, and if we don't have a proper concept of death and dying, we really can't do much in the way of helping them. All right, appreciate your comments.